First of all, the thank yous. I would like to thank the Law School at the University of Lisbon, in particular Eduardo, for inviting me to be here today. I would also like to begin with an apology. I'm going to have to speak to you in English. As you can hear, my English is my second language. <laughs> I have a very strong American accent, as you can hear. So let us begin with this um, a rather serious topic. So why did I get interested in, in writing a book about this? Uh, it was alluded to in Eduardo's comments. I grew up on the welfare state. I grew up in poverty. And because of the schools that were around at that time and the transfers that were made possible by that, I became an Ivy League professor. And that's how capitalism should work. Because if there is the chance for someone like me to become that person, then there is fairness and justice in the system. If, however, we create a world that is incredibly unequal, where those who have the assets and the incomes get those assets and incomes bailed out, and then the cost of our insurance policy is passed down to those further down the line who can least afford to pay for it, that undermines the very ethos of fairness in a capitalist society, and it exposes it for what it is, an insider game. That's why I wrote this book. We're in danger of turning it into an insider game. And I will try and explain why there is now. In what follows, I will try and convince you of two things. The narrative that we are told that there is a crisis of sovereign debt brought about by runaway public spending is flatly false. I will show you the numbers. What actually happened was a banking crisis was very deftly and politically turned into a sovereign debt crisis that everyone else except the people in the banks and those who have the assets and the incomes have to pay for. I will then shift gears and tell you why this is a dangerous idea. And I call it a dangerous idea because a dangerous idea is one that no matter how many facts you throw at it, it becomes more robust over time. And austerity is one of those ideas that no matter how many facts you throw at it, how many contradictory pieces of evidence, it is belief is held more tenaciously the longer it goes on. And that is why it's dangerous. In financial markets, they call this being caught in the idea. You might have an idea for a trade. You think it's a really brilliant idea. And it's contingent upon lots and lots of moving parts coming together all at once. And then the moving parts start to move away from you. But you love your idea. You don't want it to not be true. So you double down. You double your bet. You hope that it comes off. And suddenly, it doesn't work at all. You've been caught in the idea. You should have changed your mind. It's so much easier to change your mind than it is to sweep up the damage. And we have caused a lot of damage. So what is austerity anyway? Austerity is not cutting when you grow. I think we should all pay back debt so long as we have incomes. And if you do not have incomes and you pay back debt, what you are doing is liquidating your assets. And if you liquidate your assets to pay back your debt, all you end up with at the end of it is more debt and a smaller pool of assets. This is true for households, firms, and governments, which is why I'm about to show you we have more debt than ever, despite all the sacrifices that have been made. As Keynes said back in the 1930s, the boom, not the slump, is the time for austerity. And in fact, all of those cases that have been reported of countries that supposedly cut public spending and then grew, which I'll talk about later, in fact did so in a boom. They did so when they had their own currency, and they did so when they were exporting to a country, which is a neighboring country, with a much larger economy, who was able to take in all of its exports. None of those conditions pertain to the Eurozone today. On the other side, we have austerity is cutting in a slump, which is turbocharged when everyone does it at the same time, and they are all each other's trading partners. This quote is from Wolfgang Schauble. It is an undisputable fact that excessive state spending has led to unsustainable levels of debt and deficits now that threaten our economic welfare. Piling on more debt now will stunt rather than stimulate growth in the long run. Governments in and beyond the Eurozone need not just to commit to fiscal consolidation and improved competitiveness, they need to start delivering on these now. Now note the causal claim. What has happened here is that excessive public spending cause has led to excessive debt effect. Right, let's have a look at this then. So this is basically Euro area and government debt to GDP through 2013. And you can see we are piling on the debt absolutely since 2009. And we started cutting in 2010. 
and the debt gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's kind of odd, isn't it? And as, as for that sort of, you know, huge orgy of public spending, I, it's, it's actually quite hard to see it. So let's have a look at some cases. So here's the Greeks. Everyone knows the Greeks were at least the worst case. They obviously had their hands in the till. Let's have a look. Well, there's Greek debt to GDP, and on a five-year moving average, it's flat. And it's not until 2009 it goes up by a tiny amount, and then it's only when they begin to slash their economy through spending cuts that the debt piles on. This is very simple to understand. Imagine the economy as a fraction, let's say four over five, and the four represents your debt, and the five represents the economy. So that four over five is 0.8, 80% debt to GDP. Now let's say that you want to do a 20% public spending cut. You just take the five and turn it into a four. What's just happened to your debt to GDP ratio? It's now 100%. Congratulations, you got 20% more debt because you cut. That's what's been going on in the Eurozone because it's zero sum against the assets that are supposed to generate the income. Now let's have a look at Greek public spending. Actually, over a 10 year period, it's actually not that big. There's a spike here before the austerity budgets really cut in, but it's not that big. And I'll show you who in comparison is actually much worse. So here's Spain. Now Spain, of course, was winning awards for fiscal management before the crisis. As you can see, they consistently paid down their debt. But if you have a look, you will see that they also consistently spent more. Now that's a nice trick. So if you can pay back your debt and spend more money at the same time, the only way you're doing this is if someone is giving you a line of credit. Just the same as if you're running a credit card at the same time as you're actually had a stagnant income. This is very important because ultimately the claim I'm going to make is the following. If there has been a crisis of overspending, it is private sector and you cannot have overspending without overlending. And that brings us back to banks. Ireland looks just like Spain, only it's worse. So what have we got here? Latvia, this is the one everyone loves. They're the success story. So there's Latvia, which looks just the same as everyone else. And they also have the oddest pattern of public spending in the world. I mean, this looks like a heart monitor of someone who's having a heart attack. Right? And you know why it's like this? Basically, the, the peaks, the, the troughs are when Russians don't pay their taxes. And they put it in Latvia's corresponding banking sector, and then they get a big boom. They've got a balanced budget rule. They get some money, it peters out, and it goes down again. That's how they run a country. This is supposed to be a model for everyone else. And what about Germany? They're the ones who have got fiscal probity and tell everyone else, well, Oh my goodness, look at that. And look at that. That's, and that's after the crisis. So all of the spending comes after the crisis, which means that the effect precedes the cause. That's a bit odd for everyone who's telling us the story. An orgy of government spending led to the crisis because the government spending comes after the crisis. So what could be going on? Let's have a look at Portugal. You're not even that bad in comparison to what I've shown you. So what caused this? This is the picture you need to know. This is the convergence of European 10-year bond yields. And there's two stories. One is the story that you probably heard, which has to do with the European Central Bank and this notion of credibility. And it's a very nice story. And like most stories, it's a story, because it's not true. And the real story has to do with what's called the greatest moral hazard trade in human history. And it's basically the game that the banks played against states. So let me walk you through both of them. Back in the day before the euro came in, if you wanted to get a Greek bond, which were actually quite hard to find, they were thinly traded, you got 25% for holding that thing. Think about that. That's amazing yield. Now, why do you get that? Well, because the risk premium represents the fact that Greece hasn't run a public uh, surplus in 50 years. So there's a risk of default, and they have their own currency and at that time, and they could default. And let's look at Italy and France. They're around 15%, 12%. That's a lot of money for holding a sovereign debt because at the end of the day, sovereigns are the safest asset because they have taxpayers and they can raise taxes and they can pay back the debt intergenerationally. That's the credible commitment they can make that companies can't do. Hence why the sovereign ceiling exists. Companies can never be rated higher than their sovereigns, right? Now look what happens. What happens in 1992? There's a thing called the Maastricht Treaty. 
And the Maastricht Treaty comes in, and these sovereigns, because of the Maastricht Convergence criteria, begin to shut their budgets down and constrain their growth, etc. And growth falls and unemployment goes up. But the bond spikes start to come down. And then, really, what happens in 1999, what happens, of course, is everyone gives up their printing press and it gets moved to Frankfurt. And the ECB comes out and there's this wonderful, shiny new Bundesbank for others. And we're all going to have German credibility now. And if you think about it, this economic story is very simple and very seductive. By giving away your printing press, the Italians can no longer devalue. So you take devaluation risk off the bond. So obviously the yield should reflect that. And you also take inflation risk away because they cannot run the printing press. So obviously inflation risk goes away. And that, plus the credibility of this new central bank, which has only one job, ensuring price stability and fighting inflation, is why those yields go down. Then we all become Germany. And then there's the financial crisis in America, but that happens in 2008. And it's not until basically the middle of 2009 that all those yields start to go again. Now, why did they do that? Because you will remember that after the crisis, there was all this talk about, oh, the Americans and the Brits, Anglo-Saxon capitalism out of control, over levered bank. Europe was different. And then 18 months later, it wasn't. So let me tell you another story. Imagine I run a big European bank. And I know that this thing called the euro is coming in. I see all those very nice yields that I can make 10, 12% on just by buying it and holding it. Because I know France is not going to go bankrupt. And I think, oh, damn, all that's going to go away. Because if they take inflation risk off the table and exchange rate risk off the table, then those yields are going to go down. I'm not going to make as much money. So how do you make money on a declining yield? You do what's called a volume convergence trade. You basically make the same bet, but you buy it with as much debt and short-term financing as you possibly can. You stuff your balance sheet with as much debt as you possibly can to amplify the, debt, the, uh, the uh, payoff that you get from buying and holding the debt. Now, imagine this is, we're all banks, and we all play the same game. If I know that you're going to buy these bonds, and the yield's going to decline, and you know that I'm going to buy them, what's going to happen? You're going to try and get as many as you can. And as we all try and do the same thing, what happens? The yields begin to decline, and then they decline all the way practically to zero. And now what happens to the balance sheets of European banks? They double in size. They treble in size. They become absolutely enormous, stuff not just with sovereign debt, but with what sovereign debt, because that's triple A collateral, thanks to a European Commission ruling in 2001 that said they should all be treated the same in repo transactions. So I have a limitless repo collateral to go out and make lots and lots of loans. And there's no yield in the north anymore, and I can't play this game anymore. So what can I do? Well, I can go to the south, and I can buy your banks, and I can flood your local funding markets. And I can give you money. And I can say basically to Spain, why would you bother trying to make a car to sell in the market against the Germans? Why not just sell them your car factory, and then they will give you the money to buy a BMW? And that's how Spain was able to pay back its debt and increase public spending at the same time, whilst generating a giant property bubble. Portugal was minor in comparison to what went on in some of the best behaved countries before the crisis. Now, if this is the case, why is this a moral hazard trade? Because those banks become individually too big to fail, and they turn to their national sovereign and say, hey, I'm bigger than your GDP, and I'm filled with rubbish assets, so you're going to have to bail me out if I get into trouble. And then they say, oh, unfortunately, we can't do that anymore because we gave away our printing presses. So you'll have to go to the ECB. And the markets assumed that the ECB would act like any sensible central bank. They would be the lender of last resort. They would make sure that those bonds were guaranteed. Only it didn't quite work out that way. So the banks played a moral hazard trade against their sovereigns, which cheapened their capital costs and allowed them to run enormous amounts of leverage and make huge amounts of loans all over the Eurozone periphery, which allowed Portugal, basically, and other countries to live beyond their means. But this is not an orgy of public spending. This is an orgy of private spending, which, when it goes bad, is socialized and dumped on the balance sheets of the state, who don't have their own printing press. This is my favorite advert from the crisis. In 2003 to 2006, Citibank, largest bank in the United States at that point, had an advertising campaign. It was Live Richly. It was a billion dollar advertising campaign. Look at this, open a cravings account. This is an actual advert for a bank. Not save up your money, not invest wisely, live richly. The tenor of the times.
Now, you cannot have overspending without overlending. So let's look at the lending side of this equation. Assets held in banks in Germany, France, and the UK are about double the annual GDP of the entire EU. So there's bank assets in the EU, about 47 trillion, and there's GDP about, well, it's actually a little bit higher now, it's about 15 trillion. So there you see the problem. Your banks are multiple times the size of your sovereigns, and your sovereigns don't have a printing press. That's a huge liability built into the system right at the start. Now, if you're doing a moral hazard trade, you're assuming that the ECB is going to bail this out. But the ECB is constitutionally and under treaty intellectually unable to do so. So you have this accident waiting to happen. Let's see some comparisons. I got that one now. Yes, yeah, that's it. So here's the too big to fail USA. Top six bank assets, 61% of GDP. There's GDP. There's the total banking sector. Now, the US prints the global reserve asset, has 14 aircraft carriers, about 2,000 nuclear weapons, and can basically do whatever it wants. So when one of those banks fails, it's not really that big a deal. And they have a central bank that does quantitative easing. This is money printing. People in Germany are terrified of this. But it kind of misunderstands what quantitative easing is. It's an asset swap. In order to get this problem solved, in order to delever these banks, you basically have to engage in asset swaps. You need to take the toxic assets off their books, bury them on the central bank's balance sheet, call them something opaque that the public doesn't understand, and then flush the banking system with as much liquidity as you possibly can find. It worked. That's why America's growing at 2.8%, and you're growing at less than 1%, because they actually managed to do this. Now, let's have a look at France. There's French GDP, there's the top three French banks, there's total bank assets, and they don't have a printing press. I hope you're shocked. This is why this is not really a government debt crisis. Here's the United States, the sinner in all of this. There's government debt in the United States. This is backed up, as I said, by the global reserve asset, immigrants, taxpayers, and nuclear weapons. This is total financial sector debt, which is backed up by nothing except credit and promises. So why are we so worried about this when they have taxpayers and these guys have nothing but leverage? But it's why you have austerity policies, because at the end of the day, this is a banking crisis, and Europe has been unable to address its banking crisis. It has been unable to find a central bank mandate that will allow it to do quantitative easing and necessary uh, volumes. It does not engage in asset swaps. It, it sets up programs such as OMT, which it then doesn't use. And the whole thing, as I'll show you in a moment, rests upon the fact that we move from Trichy to Draghi. So why do we have austerity pro uh, policies if it's really a banking crisis? Well, the problem is you can't solve a banking problem with budget cuts. You can cut Greek or Portuguese public spending to Neolithic levels, and it's not going to do anything at all for the leverage on SOCGEN's balance sheet and how it's cross-contaminated with bad Spanish real estate assets. It's not. You can just keep cutting. It's not going to make any difference. You can't run a gold standard in a democracy in theory, and if you think of the euro as a kind of hard money regime because you don't have a printing press, the choices of inflation and devaluation are gone, so all you have is internal deflation. But if everyone internally deflates at the same time, and they're each other's trading partners, then the ability of them all to export more to each other becomes impossible. By definition, everything sums to zero in an economy. So for someone to export, there has to be somebody importing. And if you're slashing your ability to spend money because you're cutting, then you can't do it, even if you're becoming more competitive. Now, people will vote for this once if they believe it's going to work. They might even vote twice. But the Americans have a phrase, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you. This is all about stopping a, ba a bank run around the bond market. Why do we care about Greece and Portugal? They're tiny economies. Because basically by saying that all euro debt is the same and will be treated the same in repo transactions, these became anchors, AAA credit anchors for large bank portfolios. And if Greece defaults, as was likely because the central bank did not stand behind Greek debt and the yields spike and they become insolvent, the markets start pricing in breakup risk. That's what you see in the spreads. They start thinking, wait a minute, what am I holding here? This isn't like an American bond or a British bond. At the end of the day, this thing could go bang, so therefore the yields start to move apart. Now, any central bank can solve this. It just has to make a credible commitment to stand behind the bond. But that was what was lacking. So why do we care about Portugal and Greece? Because if 2% of GDP of the Eurozone defaults, 
the bank has to make that whole or it has to make a loss and it has to move the asset from the banking book to the trading book and declare a loss. Now banks don't like doing that, particularly when they're running leverage ratios of 40 to 1. So then they would liquidate something else to cover that loss, which would be probably to sell Portugal. And if everyone tried to sell Portugal at once, what happens to the price of Portugal? So now we're up to 7% of Eurozone GDP. And then we'll try and sell Ireland, because that's the next most likely one. And then once everybody sold Ireland, the only thing left to sell is Spain. But Spain's too big. You can't sell Spain. You just crash the market. So the reason we have austerity policies is because we can't face up to a banking crisis we can't fix. And ultimately, we've been doing the following. Squeeze, add liquidity, and pray. That's it. Now, how do you solve this problem? Well, you can't solve it, but what you can do is keep it going. And we do this with the help of Mr. Draghi, because you can kick the can down the road with unlimited liquidity to keep the banks afloat. So here we have Italian 10-year bonds, and basically you can generate this for pretty much every single country's uh, Eurozone bond. And what you see here is going into the crisis, starts to spike, starts to spike, and up here, Draghi comes in, LTR01, a trillion euros of liquidity. Yields suddenly go down, but nobody quite believes them. So they do it again. They'll do LTRO2, chuck another half a trillion of liquidity, and the yields go down. But then people start to think that nothing's really happening, so maybe those yields start to creep up again. So you start doing emergency liquidity assistance, which basically keeps Portuguese, Greek, and Irish banks alive. And those yields go down all the way right until the point where Draghi makes his promise, I will do whatever it takes. And that's when the yields fell. Now, here we have a situation. Remember that first graph I showed you, all the debt going up? So the debts have gone up and up and up and up. And the yields since 2011 have gone down and down and down and down. So what was lacking wasn't the markets craving austerity. It's not as if bond traders in New York lie awake wondering about the education budget of Portugal. They couldn't care less. But they can care less if the ECB doesn't behave like a normal central bank. And it wasn't until Draghi made his promise, I will do whatever it takes, that the markets believed it. So the yield is invariant to the budget. Why then are you crashing your budget if it's got nothing to do with your yields? You don't need to do this. It's suicidal. The governments themselves have debts going down into the crisis. They go up massively during the crisis, despite all the cuts, and yet the yields go down. And the predictable cost is Eurozone average unemployment. That's how you pay for it. Now, Let's shift gears. Why did anybody ever think this is a good idea? It's a very good question. So that's what I want to investigate in the book. So this is John Locke, for those of you who are interested in 17th century English political thought. There's a very famous book he did called The Two Treaties of Government. And of course, this is the foundation stone of liberalism, and it talks about the civic community and so on and so forth, and the rights of the individual and the tyranny of kings and all that. But the most interesting part is the bit that was written elsewhere and stuck in the beginning of the book in the third edition. It's called the chapter on property. And in the chapter on property, here's a thorny problem. God gives us everything in common, and yet I'm part of a class who's engaged in a civil war to depose the king so that we can take over the state and have as much as we want. Because that's what the English Revolution was all about. It was the establishment of modern conceptions of private property. Now, Locke's a very smart guy. And Locke begins to figure out that if he has this new system that he wants, whereby you can have alienation of wages and labor and so on and so forth, and we all have these voluntary contracts rather than tithes and the feudal relationships of the past, you're going to end up with a hugely unequal society. And he's quite clear about who's in the common wheel, as he calls it. It's the property owners, and everyone else is outside. And if you attack property, then you're in a state of war with those in the common wheel. Now, this is a very anti dem no democracy in this at all. This is like rule by property owners. But he recognizes he's got a problem then, because there's obviously going to be more people outside the common wheel not benefiting as much as the people inside the common wheel who are benefiting. So they're going to need the state. That's the whole point. The state becomes the policeman that basically stabilizes your property rights. But this is the liberal dilemma. This is the American Second Amendment, why they still have guns, and they're all upset with the state. Because that state that can protect you if it's big enough and strong enough to protect you, can also take away your stuff. So you have this dilemma. You hate the state, but you need it. And most of all, just like today, you don't want to pay for it. So how are you going to create these markets 
that need the state to police them and the distributions they make possible unless you're willing to pay for a state that you don't want in the first place. And this has been this relationship that liberalism has had with the state since its inception. Now jump forward 100 years and you get to Adam Smith and David Hume, who I was very shocked to discover are actually the same person. Which is, it's really? These, I had to check which one was which. It's kind of strange. Anyway, David Hume's essays on interest and money and so on are fabulous to read them because so much of modern economics is still there. I'll give you an example of this, right? Short-run stimulative effect of money, long-run neutrality of money. This is basic macro stuff that you get in graduate school. It's in his essay on money. He said, merchants are the best of all classes because what we do when you give us money, we put it to good use, whereas other people don't. Doesn't that sound like what bankers tell you? And that's great, and it sort of increases the velocity of circulation. And this is good for everyone, but of course, you can't just print money and hope that that continues. It just eventually dissipates. It's amazing, the long-run utility of money sitting there in his work. Now, what else does he know? He knows that this state is still very important. And society, in the Scottish Enlightenment period, yes, we had an Enlightenment too, uh, the Scottish Enlightenment period is a very unequal society, although it's dynamic and growing and commercial. So you need that state. You have to pay for it. So how do you pay for it? This is when government debt starts to make an appearance. There's been government debt from the time of the Medici's, if, in fact, earlier. But it becomes a stable part of life around the 1750s. Now, why is this? Because they keep going to war, even though you've got rid of some of the kings. But more importantly, you need to pay for the state. Now, if you think about it, government debt is a free option in banking terms. So I need you to protect me. I'm going to loan you the money to protect me. You're going to give me all the money back, and you're going to pay me interest. This is fantastic. This is literally free money. But this is where the liberals get worried, and this is the same problem they have with debt today. In order for that to be true, I have to give you a rate of interest on the bond that's as good as putting my money to work in the real economy, crowding out. And if it's easier just to buy a bond and take the money, why would I invest in the real economy? And Hume says all of the gold and silver that makes the circulation of commodities possible is crowded out by the issuance of debt. We end up indebted to ourselves and then terribly indebted to foreigners. And the only result can be the eventual bankruptcy of the state. Sound familiar? Adam Smith, even better. You go to the core of Adam Smith's thought. Why is it that we have capitalism? It's because we are hardwired to save. He has this notion of parsimony versus prodigality and insists that men are born, of course, it's always men, but men are born with this in their soul and it does not leave them until the grave. And we will save and we will be productive. And this is basically supply side economics where it comes from. Savings automatically becomes investment and then through the workings of Say's law, supply creates its own demand and therefore whatever's in the market is sufficient to buy the market and the market clears. This is classic Smithian economics. But he also recognizes something, and my favorite smoke quote from Adam Smith is the following. It's at the end of book four of The Wealth of Nations. Civil government, insofar as it is instituted, is instituted for the defense of the rich against the poor, or those who have property against those who do not. Go check it out. He really said that. I give that on exams. All the students say, Karl Marx. Wrong. It's Adam Smith. So he's completely aware of this. And he says, now, how am I going to pay for the state that's going to protect me? Because my other favorite quote from him, wherever there is a rich man, there is 500 poor. And were it not for the strong arm of the civil magistrate, he would forever sleep in fear and his investments would go waste. Come on, you don't get a clearer expression of this, do you? So how are you going to do this? Now, Smith's a smart guy. And he said, what about taxes? And he says something very interesting. At the beginning of his canons of taxation, he starts with proportionality. He says, those with the most skin in the game, those with the most investment in society, the richest, should pay the most taxes because they get the most protection. And then he quickly backtracks because he realizes that's basically him and his friends, and they're going to have to pay all the taxes, and he really doesn't want this. So just as modern Republicans in the United States want, he suggests, wait for it, a national consumption tax on everything except luxuries, because, of course, that's what him and his mates consume. Now, he then realizes, it's fascinating, this stuff. He then realized that will never raise enough money. So what are you left with? You're left with the issuance of government debt. He comes to the same conclusion by a different route, that the only way I can protect myself is by this thing called debt. But he also believes the same thing, that debt perverts parsimony. It stops us saving. It undermines the wheels of investment. It crowds out the economy, and eventually we all end up in debt and bankrupt.
Now, at the time that they were writing, British debt to GDP was around 60%, which is very high for a pre-modern economy. And by 1815, because of fighting the Napoleonic Wars, it was over 200%. So they had reasons for thinking this. But it's not as if the British economy collapsed, is it? By 1867, debt to GDP was in single figures. Why? Because of the Industrial Revolution, because of capitalism, because of imperialism, because of growth. Growth cures debt. Cutting debt makes more debt. That's what they got wrong, but it's the message that we take from them till this very day. The result is what I call the can't live with it, can't live without it, don't want to pay for it problem. Or liberalism's neuralgia with debt and the aspirin of austerity. We will take this aspirin even if it doesn't work, because that's what you're meant to do. Now, this leads to two stories through the 19th century. On the left-hand side, we have the very handsome David Ricardo, and on the right-hand side, we have the less handsome John Stuart Mill. And basically, the Ricardian story, which leads through to uh, modern uh, Austrian, well, Austrian economics and various others on this side, and, and modern neoclassicism, essentially says that the state is a waste of time. Right? You, you, there's no point in thinking about it. Transfers are zero-sum against themselves. If you spend money now, you have to raise taxes later on. There's no multipliers. There's nothing like this. This is basically the Ricardian version of events. And in this case, what should you do with this inequality problem? Well, deport your poor to Australia. That's a good example. Right? Basically, you're going to deal with it. As Ricardo says, the condition of the poor is most wretched and will remain so. There you go. Nothing to do. Now, Four years later, the condition of the poor is most wretched, and they're beginning to threaten people like John Stuart Mill and his friends who have all the stuff. And John Stuart Mill and his friends start to say, maybe we should basically transfer some stuff down to the lower orders. Because if they do, they might not come and burn our house down. And this it begins that whole tradition of the new liberalism, which leads all the way through Keynes, Beveridge, Hobhouse, all that to the modern welfare state. So you have these two stories that emerge in the 19th century. One is the state's useless. It's a burden. There is no inequality problem so long as the economy is growing and we can all be more competitive and more efficient. Sound familiar, right? And there's another one that says there's a huge problem and eventually people will come and burn your house down. You better do something about it. When does this become important? becomes important in the midst of the Great Depression. This is my favorite depression picture. The American standard of way, the world's highest standard of living. There's no way like the American way. This is a soup line in the Great Depression. Now, why is this such an important moment? Such an important moment for what it does to our arguments about economics. Anyone know who this is? Schumpeter. You know what's amazing? That's actually not a caricature. He really looked like that, which is amazing. Now. Schumpeter, along with the Austrians and American economists such as Wesley Mitchell at Columbia University in the 1920s, had this idea of what they called modern business cycle theory. And it's really just like real business cycle theory today, only there's less math. And the basic idea is things go up, things go down, there's not a lot you can do about it, so don't try. That's basically it. Now, what does that mean in terms of how you get economic booms and slumps? Because the problem for the Ricardian vision is if everything balances out and the state stays out of the way, then there shouldn't be these big booms and slumps. So what's going on? Ah, you see, what happens here? These problems are banks. Really? Yeah, there's too much credit. Sound familiar? And all of that credit has led to what we call a capital structure, basically the, the stuff that makes stuff in the economy, which is wrong for where we really should have. Now, how you know what you really should have is a complex question. But basically, we've got too much of the wrong type of capital and investment. And this misallocation basically has to be purged. That's it. So Andrew Mellon, who was Treasury Secretary for Herbert Hoover, emblem, uh, his emblematic statement on this is, the solution to the crisis is simple. Liquidate the farmers, liquidate the debtors, liquidate the banks, liquidate basically everything. And then the great line that people don't remember, the next line is, more uh, competent people will come along and sift through the wreckage and pick up the pieces. So basically, just let it all go to hell and then pick it up. Now, here's the problem with the Great Depression. The more competent people didn't show up and basically, if the explanation for the depression was, as we had at that time, when, why there was such unemployment, everyone was suddenly was unable to work or unwilling to work at the prevailing wage, that meant that worldwide around 60 million people decided to go on unpaid leave for 14 years, which is a bit of a weak explanation. 
Now, the British, of course, had exactly the same ideas as the Americans, as they usually do, only they put it in a nicer way. And this is this famous memorandum of, on, uh, the memorandum commenting from the, the Treasury on a pamphlet by a guy called Henderson and another guy called Keynes on the feasibility of public works. Now, what they said was exactly the standard line, that markets left the loaner efficient, and if the state gets involved, it crowds out capital, so there's no point in public spending. And also, if you do this, it's zero sum against investment and Ricardian equivalence, it's called today, you're going to have to raise taxes to pay for it because it's still zero sum. It doesn't do anything, right? There's no multiplier effect. And lastly, echoing criticisms of the Obama stimulus in 2008, there just aren't enough public works around anyway so that you, know, you, you can't do this. We, we don't need stuff. Now, if you ever spent any time in England, the claim that they don't need public works at any point in their history is a thin one. This is a country that can't innovate windows. This is a country that hasn't figured out the shower as a complex technology. So I think that's a pretty weak claim. Now, individually rational decisions can be collectively disastrous. When you, people talk about what was the economic resolution of the 40s, it wasn't government financing and public financing and Keynesian economics. It's the idea of a macro economy, that the economy itself is not scalable that what's true for the whole is not true for the sum of the parts. That when people make individually rational decisions to save, if we all save at the one time, that can be collectively disastrous. And this became turbocharged in the environment of the 1930s because the Great Depression did not rebound. More competent people did not show up. And we stagnated and began to deflate. And in that time, the five biggest economies in the world, the US, the UK, Germany, France, and Japan, all undertook simultaneous contractions. The history of Japan in the book was the one that shocked me the most, because I didn't know anything about this. I had to go off and read this. It's incredible what happened. So imagine it's the end of World War I. You're on the Allied side, even though you didn't really do much, apart from annoy the Russians slightly. And then the world economy is about to take off. You're going to sell all the stuff through exports, because you've got this export-driven economy model, which you've borrowed basically from the Germans, right? Apart from you've got the American post office for doing credit rotation, but you've got this export economy, uh, economy, and the next thing is world trade collapses. And you're, oh, what are we going to do? Well, we have to be more competitive. So the finance minister, Inouye, goes around the country and goes on radio and public speeches and all this sort of stuff, basically getting the public to not spend any money and to cut back government spending. And they take 30% of GDP out of the economy. And in between 1923 and 1924, they go through the deepest depression in modern history, the Shoah recession, as deliberate public policy, so they can become super competitive. Well, that only makes sense if the rest of the world economy is growing, and it's not. It's slowing down. So guess what they do? They do it again. They take another 10% out of their economy. And the only bit of public spending left at that point is the military. And once you start taking away the guns from the boys, the boys get very annoyed. And the military said, enough, and they stepped up, and they killed two prime ministers, two finance ministers, several junior cabinet ministers, and the heads of six commercial banks. Austerity can rack up quite a body count. So the problem with this, of course, is for normal people in a deflation, your first best response to protect yourself leaves you worse off, which is why it's very scary. If you're a worker and you hear that there are no jobs unless you're willing to work for less, you're willing to work for less, so you take a wage cut. What happens in the aggregate if everyone takes a wage cut? There's less consumption. If there's less consumption, the employer can't sell the stuff the employer sells, so the employer cuts employment, which then leads to a cut in wages, and you get caught in a death spiral. And this is exactly what was happening. Individually rational decisions at every level of society led to collectively disastrous results. And what was the result? Extremism. Here is a graph, German unemployment and the Nazi vote. The Germans like to tell themselves the story that inflation brought Adolf Hitler. Here's why that's rubbish. The inflation happens in 1923. As you can see at that point in time, unemployment is actually relatively low at 10% post-war. A lot of unemployment in Central European economies. It then spikes in 1925, but there's the Nazi vote, right? Now look what happens. Stagnant unemployment. Rising, rising, rising. There's the Nazi vote share. Unemployment brought extremism, not inflation, because there was no way to protect yourself. There was no social safety net. Now, we have those things now, which is why we're not tearing each other's faces off quite yet, but we are very close. So where do bad ideas like this hibernate? Because surely World War II and the experience of the 1930s and the revolution in economics showed that we can't do this anymore, that austerity is a really silly thing. Individually, if everyone else is growing, you can be as austere as you like, 
Go on a debt buyback spree, not a problem, so long as you're generating income to do it. But if you're not generating the income, it's zero sum against your own efforts. It's individually rational, collectively disastrous. Well, where do bad ideas hibernate? Well, they go to Germany. And uh, on here we have Walter Eucken, who was one of the Freiburg liberals. And the Freiburg liberals are an interesting bunch. At the end of World War II, there weren't many German economists the Allies wanted to deal with. And liberalism had always had a rough time in Germany, because back in 1873, they had a huge stock market bubble, and it blew up. Just at the time that Bismarck and Krupps and the industrialists and the marriage of Iron and Rye was about to happen. So the German state lost faith in free market liberalism and developed their own particular very big firms, very big banks, cartelized economy based upon exports, which we still have today. Now, after the war, you want to get growth going again. You want to stabilize Germany, particularly because the Russians are on your doorstep and you've just lost a third of your population to now East Germany. If this is the case and you have a late development export-led growth model and these guys come to power, what are they going to tell the Americans? How do we get this done? Well, they don't want a big state, obviously, and that's bad for liberalism and bad particularly in the legacy of Nazism. But you don't fear the state. That neuralgia that the English have, the Americans have, this fear of the state, Germans don't have that. They see the role of the state as to be what the Ordo Liberals, as these guys were called, called the economic constitution. You would set the general framework of rules within which firms would operate. And you would make sure that they wouldn't do what American firms and Japanese firms and Chinese firms are doing today. Think Apple versus Samsung. They spend all their time buying up patents and then suing each other in court. What do you do instead? You get BMW and Mercedes to compete against each other in third country markets, incrementally improving all the time until you have the best products you possibly can. This is a brilliant strategy. Now, how do you make sure that your products are competitive? Well, you invest in your engineering skills and all this, obviously. But you also need sound money. You need to know that you've got a very low inflation environment, which is why Keynesianism never made any sense to the Germans. It's a bit like Canada. If you live by exports and you pump up wages, that's ultimately just going to increase the end price of your exports. So you will become less competitive. So how do you do it? You do it through competition. You do it through competitiveness. This makes perfect sense if you're an export-led economy. And that's precisely what you end up with as the model of the German economy in the post-war period, plus an undervalued exchange rate, which the Allies allowed until the Deutschmark was replaced by the Euro, and the Euro now gives Germany an undervalued exchange rate as well. So competition, not consumption. Sound money in central bank independence. Exports, yes. Keynes, no. That's why they've never bought it, and it's been brilliant for them. But it's only brilliant for them because there can only be one. It's like the Highlander movie. Remember this? There can only be one. We can't all be Switzerland. For Switzerland to be Switzerland, everybody else has to be not Switzerland, right? You can't all be a tax haven. You have to have somebody paying taxes to be a tax haven. You can't all be the world's best export, or somebody has to be the importer on the other side of that equation. Now, Back in the day when we brought in the euro, nobody was really thinking about this because there was lots of easy money. Remember all that? The banks were lending, everybody's got collateral, there's a huge credit bubble. So you generalize this framework, and this becomes the architecture for Europe. And you basically have a commission, which is dominant over the parliament. You have sound money in the European Central Bank, far more important than output considerations. You have a central bank that has only one rule, fight an inflation that died in 1924. Pretty straightforward, not very good in a deflation. You have rules, this obsession with rules and fiscal rules and fiscal treaties because that's the economic constitution again. And finally, competitiveness, a single-minded obsession with competitiveness, forgetting, of course, that competitiveness is a relative term. You're only relatively more or less competitive to your competitors. And it's not as if the German economy is going to stop being competitive so everyone else can catch up. And if you don't have the type of products that they have to compete in those markets, what exactly do you sell, particularly if you're Portugal? Which basically means you become competitive on wages. And all that does is shrink your underlying economy and paradoxically increase rather than decrease your debts. So we're all told to be more competitive, despite the fact that it's a giant fallacy of composition. And then came the crisis. So why did those yields spike? Why did they all move apart then? Why was it 12 months after the crisis in America, by the time which the Americans had already got a handle on it, and the American central bank had already started doing quantitative easing through the back door, through the maiden lane programs? Well, we can thank Mr. Trichet for this one, because in his speech on May the 7th, 2009, he started the crisis. Because he said to the financial markets the following, 
the idea for the program is a very limited program. They were saying, what are you going to do? The stress is in the markets. is to revive the market for cover bonds, which has been very heavily affected. And all that goes with this revival, including the spreads, the depth, the liquidity of the market. We are not at all embarking on quantitative easing. Really? That's fascinating, because that's your job. What you did there is the covered bond market. Covered bonds are less than 1% of total bond issuances. They're usually things like municipal bonds. They're a tiny, tiny thing. It's like you walked in, you're a surgeon, you walked into the operating room, someone's bleeding to death, and you said, wow, they need a haircut. Now, this has nothing to do with anything. Why is he talking about the covered bond market? It's zero. Nobody cared. They cared about the sovereign bond market, and the stress is there. And when you say you're not doing quantitative easing, what you're saying is, I'm not going to asset swap banks. I'm not going to take all the crappy assets out of the bank and put them on my balance sheet and flood them with liquidity and allow them to delever and start the credit cycle again. I'm not going to guarantee these triple A things which we've been holding for 10 years in our bank balance sheets. I'm just not doing it. Yeah, nobody stands behind this. Good luck. And the market said, holy crap. And all those yields started to spread because, of course, they had to price in risk. And all the risks got repriced. Mr. Draghi is the one who fixes this, but it takes 12 months. Now, in the meantime, the European Commission and others basically have to do something. And what they decided to do was the worst possible thing. And part of the reason they decided to do that, because there's a very new, old, bad idea called the expansionary historicity hypothesis associated with another, ex, another head of the Harvard Economics Department, this time Alberto Alessina, and the very influential Bocconi School in Milan, who stuff a great many positions in Brussels and throughout Europe. And the basic story that these guys have been telling since the 1980s is that people have rational expectations. Now, what does that mean for those of you who are not economists? We're all very long-sighted. And we lie awake at night worrying about public expenditure. Really, you don't worry about unemployment or anything like that. You worry about public expenditure. And then when the government comes along and says, you know what we're going to do? We're going to cut public spending by 30%. You recalculate your lifetime income and recognize that 20 years from now, you're going to have a lower tax burden. Thereby recalculating this, you know that you have more money to spend now in the present than you thought you did because that tax liability won't be there. So you go to Ikea and buy a couch, thus curing the recession. I'm not even being facetious, strip away all the econometrics, and that's basically what the story is. Now, this was based upon a set of very, very high-tech models, but also some case studies. Ireland in the 80s, Sweden, Canada, Denmark, Australia. And I, go through them, I went through them all in the book. I went through the econometric stuff, but then I went through the actual histories. And the actual histories are completely different from this. What do these countries all have in common? It's not that they cut public spending and the, and the average person who can barely do long division recalculated their lifetime budget and their expectations changed. This is rubbish. It's the residual in the econometrics that can't be explained by basically devaluation. So what happens in all these cases? They all have their own currency. And what happens is, take Canada as the best example is Canada in the late 70s was building up debt. And the Wall Street Journal did an article saying Canada could become the first third world country from the first world. And the Canadians are very sensitive to what Americans say to them. So they're, oh, we have to do something about this. So they decided they were going to cut debt. You know what they did? A 40% devaluation of their currency. At the same time as the American economy, by the early 80s, was about to do its morning in America trick post-1982. So the dollar goes up, the loonie goes down. The American economy takes 80% of Canada's exports, and it goes on a growth spurt. Canada makes money hand over fist and then correctly does something. It pays back a lot of debt and improves its public finance profile. This is exactly the same story for Ireland with the boom in the 1980s and also in the 2000s with England as its trading partner. In Sweden, nothing actually happened. John Quiggin has shown the Australian case is flatly wrong. And the Denmark case basically has this period whereby public spending is cut. There's meant to be an expansion because of this uh, better expectations. But then when the data stops, Denmark goes into its sharpest ever recession since 1945. So none of this stuff adds up. But it doesn't stop it going right into the Ecofin brief, which becomes the central bank policy toolkit for responding to the crisis, whereby cuts to public expenditure rather than raises in taxes are the solution to a sovereign debt crisis. But it's not a sovereign debt crisis. It's a banking crisis. You have 45 trillion assets in the Eurozone banking system in a $15 trillion economy. And you've got a $4 trillion uh, major economy as its banker, which is German. So you're trying to bail 45 with four, and you're not even in the same set of political institutions with each other. And none of you have printing presses. So all those assets are stuck there. 
huge amounts of leverage sitting in the banking book, marked at 100. Everybody knows they're worth 20. But if you take them out and put them in trading book and acknowledge the losses, God forbid, because that would mean the bank would have to make a loss. That would mean the bondholders would actually have to take a hit. It would mean the shareholders would get wiped out. There would be chaos. Right, but there's already chaos for everybody else. Because what we did by adding all that liquidity through Mr. Draghi and doing the bailouts in the US and the UK is we guaranteed our incomes. And I mean our. You're sitting here today, you probably got some incomes. You probably have some assets. You probably have a mortgage. And because those banks weren't allowed to fail, your pension is still there. Congratulations, that's great. And you know who's paying for that? Your kids. Because they're the ones who are going to be paying for this because we all have to cut debt now because we can't leave it to our children. No, you just cut public expenditure so they have a miserable present. That's how this works instead. You've just done an intragenerational put option on your own kids to save your banking system because you don't want to take any losses. We are all guilty. The result of that is what I call the greatest bait and switch in human history for obvious reasons. Now, wrapping up, you would think that reality would bite this and change it. The IMF, of all people, begin to challenge all of this stuff. They note the negative multiplier effect that a cut of one euro in public expenditure in the periphery produces a loss of 1.5 to 1.7 in real final expenditures. When we had in the second quarter, that should actually, be, if I take the, the Portuguese example of this, in the second quarter of 2013, Brussels was jumping up and down and the Financial Times was declaring mourning in Europe because Portugal had grown by 0.7%. You remember this one? What was it the next quarter? 0.1. Why did you manage to grow at 0.7 in that quarter? Because you missed your deficit targets. The only other country that grew was France. They also missed their deficit targets. So let's think about this. When you don't do austerity, you grow. And when you double down on it, you get back to zero. Why would we keep doing this? Oh, yes, that's right. We don't want those banks to fail because all of our assets are in it. Now, we've still got more debt, not less, and we keep piling it on because we have 1% growth and we're unable to fix the problem. We keep adding liquidity, squeezing, and praying. But we are, again, we're not going to pay for it. We're fine. Sitting here, most of us, we're totally fine. We're great. But it's other people who are paying for it further down the income distribution. They're the ones who are paying for it in terms of lost opportunities. They're the ones who are not going to be able to go to university the way that I did. They're the ones that are not going to have the opportunities that I had. But it's okay because we're not paying taxes. We just need to cut public spending. So we have 12% average, 25% periphery, and 50% youth unemployment. And our, process, our project going forward is to sustain that. And somehow being fictionally all more competitive with each other, that's going to be reduced on growth of around 1%. Population growth and inflation alone makes that negative. This is no way to sustain this. So where does this all end? More of the same. You have a problem with different preferences and ideas. I'm living in Berlin just now. Trust me, there's no austerity and there's no crisis. When, this, when the new government was formed, the new grand coalition, they didn't even have a committee on Europe. There is no problem, as far as they're concerned. At the same time, the ECB under Draghi wants to become a real central bank, but then they're going to have to have a fight to the death of the Bundesbank over this one. The Commission is basically trying its best to implement a series of policies that it knows, because even its own technical papers acknowledge, isn't working, but there's no alternative on the menu. And the IMF is screaming on the sidelines, asking for everyone to just loosen up a little bit. Turning Japanese, permanent austerity. You could have a lost decade. But I don't think it's sustainable, because Japan was a richer country than many countries in the European periphery. And we're already eating through La Nonna's savings. There are the transfers that are going back to the kids that no longer have jobs. And you ask people to vote for that once, they'll do it. Twice, three times, I'm not so sure. But if the solution to this is the new fiscal treaty, whereby you're allowed to have a 6% surplus but only a 3% deficit, let's think about this for a minute. That's nonsense, right? Where's that minus three going to go to? If you constitutionally outlaw running a deficit, as these new rules do, which people have signed up to and had a nice toast with mineral water, all very soberly, then that can only result in the liquidation of assets, bankruptcy, and further unemployment. There's no, you cannot have six minus three equals zero. And if you don't allow people to run those deficits, as we're not doing just now, you will end up with 0.1 growth every quarter as you continue. That is also unsustainable. So my friend Nassim Taleb talks about black swans, and I'm sure you've heard the term, but I like another one, gray swans. They're the things that you know are coming, but you just pretend you don't want to hear, think about. 
And they come in two forms. One is unexpected and sudden political unrest, which may happen or it may not. But the other one is, what if I'm Italian? Are there any Italians here? The north of your country is a developed, diverse industrial economy that's globally competitive. And if you stay in this environment, you know your future is Spain. Because you will never have the elasticities on your exports that the Germans do. So you're going to have to basically run a perma surplus, which is going to crush your domestic demand, indebt your banking system, and basically lead to the liquidation of your assets. Are you going to put up with that? Or are you going to pull the plug? I always think the Italians are very interesting for playing the wild card. And then finally, if Italy leaves, what happens? Well, that, ban that bank run through the bond market becomes on too real because we haven't dealt with that. We haven't done a thing. Now, what can be done to stop all this? It's actually really simple. If you grow at 0.7% in a quarter by not doing austerity, how about not doing austerity for two quarters? How about not doing it for four quarters? Because as I've showed you, the bond yield is invariant to the debt loading. You've been adding debt and adding debt, but your yields have gone down because all that really matters is the ECB stands behind it. You can play your own moral hazard game with the ECB. You can just say, we're not doing it anymore. Because really, the bond market is not going to throw you out because your deficit's going to go up by 10%. That's not going to happen. It's all about central bank policy. Second thing, get the banking union sorted out. If this is a banking crisis, figure out some mechanism for doing a resolution on all the toxic assets, particularly in Spain, unclog the arteries, delever the banks, and then you can get growth going again. But here's your problem. The only people who make this happen are the Germans, and they don't think there's a crisis. Moreover, they know that they're smaller than the problem, so they're afraid to do so, hence their fear of debt mutualization and everything else. And then the last one is this. In 1951, after the Wirtschaft Wunder began in Germany, when Wohlstand for Alle, Prosperity for All, was invoked with the Erdhardt reforms and the currency reforms, in 51 and 52, the German economy went into a slump. And unemployment ratcheted it up to 7 to 8%. And at that point in time, they had a problem. The problem was the Americans changed their focus. They were fighting the Korean War. They weren't pouring money hand over fist into the rebuilding of Germany anymore. So people recognized that the Germans needed a hand. So in 1953, all of Germany's creditors got together in London, and they wrote off 50% of Germany's debt. That was hugely important for the stabilization and future growth of the German economy. We need to remember that we have forgiven sins. This is not a morality play. Debt restructuring only happens when you have forgiveness. It's time for Europe to forgive itself for a spending binge that never happened. Thank you.